You know, I just realized that I've never really given an official tour of the breezeway before. Aloha ladies and gentlemen, my name is Spike Marble. I play in a band called the Hula Girls. We've played in 18 different tiki bars. I've personally been to 48 tiki bars. And then I decided to build this homage to Don the Beachcomber in the traditional style of tiki in my backyard. There's nothing in here that I didn't make myself that is newer than I'd say about 1970-ish. The outside here, this lighting thing, it, I think it's supposed to be like a fish trap or something. This came from Don the Beachcomber when they're closing. I don't think it was ever hung up in Don the Beachcomber, but it's really, really a cool piece. I wouldn't be surprised if it's vintage, either from Sam Seafood, oh look, a dog. If it's either from Sam Seafood or from some other place, because Art Snyder, the owner of Don the Beachcomber, was actually like a big tiki collector. This little half wall here actually came from Don the Beachcomber also. And I know that this this did not come from Sam's Seafood, but it did come from some vintage tiki place. I think Bamboo Ben knows where it's from. I'd be interested to, to know again where, where it is from. This rum box was actually also from Don the Beachcomber. I, uh, I'm pretty sure that Tiki Diablo built these. They used to line the stage, the front of the stage, uh, in the High Talking Chief's room next to the Hidden Village. And as somebody who performed on that stage a bunch of times, it's, uh, I'm stoked to have it in the breezeway now, or just outside of the breezeway. A couple other things out here, some uh, fish, fishing floats. I try to grow mint out here once in a while if I can for cocktails. This mask right here is actually vintage Oceanic Arts. And in fact, I tried to sell this at the Tiki Marketplace like maybe three or four years ago and nobody wanted it. Uh, I'm glad I hung on to it though. It, uh, it's doing a good job out here in front of the breezeway. This is from Oceanic Arts. Actually, this was signed signed by, by Leroy Schmaltz to Spike. Rukin Tiki Girl, what? I have, I have no idea what that said. Anyway, kind of never had any place to put it, so it just kind of lives right there. Come on inside. As we come inside, you can see on your right, that's the, uh, the first tiki that I ever carved with a chainsaw, well, a chainsaw and chisels. Uh, this tiki actually was one of the chairs at Frankie's Tiki Room in Las Vegas. If you sat in these, you know how, uh, how often they fell over. But I always think it's so funny that this part of the thing is so worn away. And I think it's from wallet chains. And this side too. So either wallet chains or like studded belts or whatever. It's kind of a punk rock tiki bar. So, but stoked to have them in here. When Bamboo Ben sold them to me, they smelled like a million cigarettes. Like a million cigarettes. But they've been outside for so long, I think they've aired out. Uh, while I'm over here, this is one of the stools from Down the Beachcomber's Dagger Bar. Uh, the Hula Girls played, I think, 100 something shows in the Dagger Bar from 2009 or something, something like that. So uh, when they were closing, Delia from Don the Beachcomber, the the owner, uh, said that she wanted me to have one of the one of the stools out of there. So it's a very nice gesture, and uh, happy to have it here in the breezeway. That's a fish trap lamp that came out of Don the Beachcomber. My buddy Rick Hamilton in Massachusetts bought this for me and sent it to me all the way from the East Coast. And it's before he started his own bar. Um, I, from, what I from what I understand, he's upset that it ended up with me because it is really an incredible piece. Like, what is, what is this horrifying head on top of the face thing? I'd love to learn more about this. 
It's kind of awkward because I don't know if you can see that, but his, his little loincloth hangs a little low. Kind of shows off his tiki dick a little bit. Can I say that on here? Uh, probably. Also, there's all this trim that I carved for the breezeway all throughout the place. See? Behind the bar, the breezeway. So there were a few estate sales that really turned the breezeway into what it is. And um, one of them, this thing came from, it was a guy who had a nautical antique store in the Newport Beach, Balboa kind of area. I bought a couple things from him over the years. He was kind of an ornery old guy, but he had the best stuff, like the best, best stuff. So I went to his estate sale at his home. I mean, his bedroom had like 70 or 80 vintage fish floats with like the Japanese stamp in them all over the ceiling of his bed. And then his bed was from like the 18, late 1800s or something. It was like a brass bed from like a, like from like a, a ship or something. It was crazy. It was that one estate sale that really took my collection to the next level. It's really hard to amass this kind of stuff just piece by piece, but I'm telling you, estate sales, or maybe I'm not telling you estate sales. You shouldn't go to estate sales. Don't worry about those. This guy came out of an antique shop in Costa Mesa. In fact, I was having breakfast one morning at a place called Dick Church's that has been around since like the 40s, I think. And uh, there was a guy who, who just knew that I collect tiki stuff. And he's like, there's this Papua New Guinea tiki in this antique store down the, down the road from where we are. And I was like, really? I've seen that antique store before, but I never like thought to look in there. So I walk in, I think it was listed for like five or $600. I mean, look how big it is. It's gotta be like six or seven feet tall. And all the shells, boar's tusk, it's an incredible piece. And I think I got the guy down to like 350 or something, which is still a lot of money, but you know, you only have room for so much stuff and if, and if you have the opportunity to get like a big piece, it's hard to ignore. I have these, these random lanterns. This came from my buddy, Big Tony. I think it's Orchids of Hawaii. I'm not totally sure, but he was nice enough to just give that to me. These tiles, from what I understand, are from a Trader Vicks. Uh, the guys at Oceanic Arts were selling them. Bought them, figured out how to tie them up and make this trellis. The uh, spitting fountain here is a really rare piece. From what I understand, maybe there are four or five that, that I've seen on the internet that people have collected, and not all of them were made into fountains. So I found this guy at the Long Beach Swap Meet. Call him a guy because originally these were supposed to be uh, women figures, but somebody had filled in the breasts, so it's just kind of a chest now, so it's a dude and somebody had also painted it. If you go through the layers, I think one time he was black, one time he was silver or white, but uh, I like how it looks now. And then I built this whole basin thing. So this was already set up to be a fountain. And by set up, I mean there was just a brass tube that ran through its mouth. I had to hook up the pump and, and the tubes and everything, and then build this whole situation for it to sit on. So uh, it sits way higher. It spits water down onto this little fish float here, which I kind of tried to make look like a, a pearl. And then the water circulates down through the bottom of this clamshell into this basin, and then that's where it recycles and recirculates back up through the mouth. It's kind of a mess. It kind of like spills all over the place. I don't know, it's pretty cool. My more interesting collectibles live right here. That one and this guy are both headhunter forks. I guess they were designed to eat brains. See? Yikes. Right above him is the breezeway sign that I made a few years ago. And that was all carved out of uh, redwood. And as we come down through here, this is a tiki that I acquired from somebody who was selling it uh, in Marina del Rey. 
And it's a Leroy Schmaltz of Oceanic Arts Carb Tiki. You really can't find big, newer Carb Tikis by him. And there's my dog. I built this little dock for him years ago so that he can go out his doggy door. And it's gotta look right, right? As we come from here, we look up to the skylight. This actually, there's a piece of plexiglass up there. This was a lamp from Down the Beachcomber that Bamboo Ben created. When they went out of business, I acquired it. There's some vintage fish floats. And then Bamboo Ben made this lamp, this outrigger lamp for, for the breezeway. This is a vintage oriental changing screen that a friend of mine at work gave me. And on it, you can see some rigging that I have plans to build right along here and then up to the ceiling. Very much in the style of the Maikai. I just haven't gotten around to it yet. Here's some paddles that I found at an estate sale in Pasadena. I got these paddles for $5. I got two other paddles also for $5. And my buddy Donnie has those two for his new tiki bar. And then this tiki. All right, I need to put the camera down for this. So when I went to that estate sale in Pasadena where I got the paddles, the main reason I went out there is because I had bid on and won a lot of Mr. Bali High mugs. Everything from probably 60s era to way earlier, like first run mugs. And then uh, there were some salt and pepper shakers, like stuff I didn't have. So there were like nine of those mugs, like nine Mr. Bali High mugs. So I bought all of those. And I was like, well, I'm here. I might as well walk around and, and check the place out. And there was kind of like some nautical stuff around. Anyway, I go into the backyard and I'm kind of snooping around. And I, and I always like to go deep into the backyards and, and if nothing more, just kind of see how people set up their backyards or, you know, you might find something cool. As I'm walking out there, I'm like, there's no, there's no way that's what I think it is. And there was a log face down kind of by this dog house. And that log was this guy. I couldn't see what it was, so I used my foot and I kind of kicked it over. And I was like, oh my God, that's a tiki. A vintage, like a vintage tiki, but it was coming apart. You can see, uh, I don't know if you can see, but there's a piece of wire. There's a piece of wire like holding his head together. So anyway, I go up to the front and I was, I was like, uh, excuse me, there's a, there's a log out there, a carved log. I don't know if you guys are interested in selling that at all, but it's just kind of laying face down in the mud. And they're like, oh yeah, you, you want that? And I was like, yeah, I, I think so. And they go, well, what do you think would be fair? And I was like, well, I mean, I don't know. I guess that's really, it's really up to you. And they go, how about, um, I don't know. How about five bucks and just like take it out of here. And I was like, five bucks. And I, <laughs> I was like, oh man, I don't know if I can carry this thing. It's like, it's, it looks pretty heavy. And I pick it up, dude, you can pick it up with one hand. It's so dry rotted. And as long as you don't bump into it or breathe on it too heavy, I think it'll be fine. But it's just standing there by a thread, like, be cool. Right next to that tiki, there's that little log and that little log was actually part of the planter from Don the Beachcomber, Sam Seafood really. These old barrels give a good nautical vintage feel to the place. And it was just a couple of real lucky estate sales where I, I came up on those things. All right, let me show you. Let me show you a little secret thing. Behind this rum barrel that actually has a fish float that I I don't know what to do with yet. Check out that hatch. Power hatch. But there's all kinds of cool stuff that I've found over the years and stuff that's even hidden. God, I gotta. I can't have that hidden like vintage boat bumpers and rope knots. That's a tiki that I carved years, years ago, this guy. And then I found him at that great estate sale, um, big nautical estate sale. This is actually a machete from Guyana. So not everything's Polynesian, but um, you know, there is like a bit of Indiana Jones or Explorer that I like having in my tiki bar kind of stuff. And I think, I think Don Beach was kind of that same way too. Whoa! 
Jesus. This is a spear. And there's like a little goat haired thing, spear protector that goes on there. Wild, huh? Oof. Hi, Astro. So I'd say that 99% of the stuff in the breezeway is Pacific Island. I think that's African right there, but I just love that thing so much. This is the Sepik region, Papua New Guinea. There's some Rapa Nui guys there. This old record player, I used to listen to records in the breezeway on it, and I left it outside too many times, and I think it's just a little dusty. I bet you I could get it going again. Maybe. There's a ship's hatch that's actually from a Chris Craft, vintage Chris Craft. That was at that big estate sale that I went to also. All right, I gotta show you something. So when I was designing the breezeway, I was kind of thinking in the back of my head, like, how would Disney do this? Because Disney does everything so well as far as theming goes. And I knew I wanted to have music out here, but like, how do you do that so that it still looks period correct? So, uh, that's a vintage ukulele, but that has nothing to do with it. Move this guy here. So this speaker right here looks period correct, right? It's probably 40s, 40s or 50s, something like that. And all I did was put a Bluetooth speaker behind it. And when people come over here and they hear music coming out of this corner, immediately they think this. And so, illusion accomplished. Here's another little half fish trap lamp that I built a while ago. There's a mother of pearl lamp that I found in a state sale. There's a fish trap lamp. I created these lamps with my ex-girlfriend Dinah DeRosa years ago. 60s swag lamps. There is another mother of pearl lamp. There's a fish trap that I hung and put a bulb inside of to turn into a lamp. This is a shell lamp that I built all myself when I came up on a whole bunch of shells. And you can see the bottom is all colored glass. This is a drum lamp that I built. This is a box lamp that I created and McBiff my good buddy and incredible artist uh, illustrated and is now on a stone brewing tiki collaboration packaging for like a 24 pack I think. This is the detail shots of the box lamp here. And the bottom of the drum lamp. There's a two tiered cylindrical lamp that I built and this little drum lamp right here that I made. And then this is from Nelson's Tiki something or other. They made that one. This lamp was modeled off of, loosely modeled off of an Orchids of Hawaii lamp. This is another lamp I designed. You can see in the middle is a ship's wheel. When I bought that, it was supposed to be used to make clocks, but it really makes a cool bottom of a lamp, doesn't it? I added shells and sea glass and then a different color sea glass in the middle and then coconut rope and manila rope all kinds of woven textures again more is more That tiki right there in the back corner, I carved with a chainsaw. I guess we should talk about this bar. So this bar here, I was on Craigslist, just hunting around Craigslist for Whitco. And lo and behold, this Whitco bar was for sale north and east of Los Angeles. I don't know where the hell that is, but I drove my Econoline like two hours, mostly uphill. The hills were on fire, literally on fire at the time. And uh, when I got there, the lady was like, well, you know, I know, they're, I know they're worth a lot of money. And I was like, yeah, yeah, they can be. And she's like, but this one's pretty beat up. So how's $200? And I was like, 
yeah, we can totally do $200. So I got one of the most sought after leopard print Witco Tiki bars for $200. My buddy actually sold me the matching stools there at the other bar. We'll go check those out in just a second. So my thinking behind these platforms that the bars sit on is just creating kind of dimension to the space. I'd imagine that you've noticed that I like to include a lot of foliage into my bar. I like the idea of the jungle trying to encroach back into this space that I've created. These are some booze bottles that I, I tied the knots for and hung. And some of my less valuable tiki mugs up there. Some bongos, a little drum. And mugs and mugs and mugs. As we move across here, what makes a good tiki bar? I'll tell you what it is. It's layers and layers and layers of stuff. Check out the village out there, out the window. This is actually the bell from our music video. Have you seen that? The Enchanted Sea. If you haven't watched it, the link is in the description. Please go check it out. It's really good. Trader Vix, Coffee Grog, Skull thing? Flaming Grog? I don't know what that is. But I bought this thing a long time ago. It's the Trader Vix trading license from 19... From 19... From 1948. And it says here that this lady Drank one dozen whiskey sours. But I guess then you get that license after you drink 12 whiskey sours. There's a small beer collection of pre vintage Primo beers. More Hawaiian tikis. And the tiki that I carved a long time ago. And actually that, that uh, mask on the wall. I made that mask years ago too. Some more stuff from down the beach come right here. That's a wall sconce that I ended up with. And then as you go up, So this is a lamp from the Bahuka in Rosemead. And it's such a shame that that place closed because whoever bought it turned it into a, like a sushi bar and then shortly thereafter went right out of business because they sucked the soul right out of the, what that place was and they thought they could do it better and they were wrong. Some pufferfish lamps that I've had for 15 years. And then there was another estate sale let me put this down for a second. So there was another estate sale that I ended up at, I think it was in Fountain Valley or something. The first day that I went there, they were selling everything crazy expensive. They thought they were sitting on a gold mine of, of Polynesian and African collectibles and stuff. But the fact of the matter is that, that you know, the Polynesian stuff is more kitsch for people and the African stuff is a pretty narrow, um, demographic I think anyway some of these big shields this mask there's a couple more masks over there came from that thing I went the first day I bought like one thing because it was really expensive I went the third day and I bought a couple more things because it was marked down and I and and I told the lady I was like I showed her a picture showed her a picture of the breezeway and I said look I don't know what's gonna happen to all the rest of this stuff, but if for some reason you have a lot of it on Monday and you don't know what to do with it, just just shoot me a text or give me a call. She did. And when I was over there, I came over on a Monday morning, told my boss that I'd come in late. She was cool with it. So I come into the house and, and I'm going around and I'm, I'm kind of grabbing things and she's like, just make a pile. And I was like, okay, I'll make a pile, but I, I, I was still kind of in my head. I, was, I think I had like four or $500 and I was like, I kind of know what I have to spend. Like, so I was, I was collecting stuff and she's like, no, here, why don't you grab this? And she kept throwing things on the pile and I was like, oh my God, there's no way I can afford all this. At the end, she was like, okay, so what do you think? And I was like, well, I only have like 400 bucks. And she was like, yeah, that's fine. What else can we throw in the pile? And I was like, what? And she just kept piling more and more stuff. And she, she kept suggesting African stuff and all this mid-century mid stuff that was kind of like a little bit too late. Not stuff that I collect. But she kept piling more and more stuff on. And I was like, 
This is incredible. So, I lucked out a couple times. That chain on top of the waterfall here came from down the beachcomber. This mask came out of that big estate sale where she was asking me to pile stuff up. In those eyes would have been uh, big shells like that. But over the years, sometimes those things get knocked out or lost. And there would be tusks. Well, there's kind of some tusks in the nose, but probably bigger. This is a fish basket that came out of Donna Beachcomber. And then actually this fish float right here, I don't know if you can tell, but it's always tricky to try to drill a hole in one of these things to put a light bulb in it. So what I do is see that piece of bamboo right there? Inside that bamboo is a whole lighting assembly. And then it just shines into that into that thing. And kind of the dirtier these things get, the more the light bounces around in them. More stuff. I found these things in orange. I think they're called Tahitian bagas. It said they're 80 something years old. Another Papua New Guinea piece. This is actually a section of the breezeway of stuff that I don't know what to do with. So you can see I have this lamp that I found at the Long Beach uh, swap meet, Long Beach auto swap meet. It's all wired up. I just got to hang it somewhere. This is actually a big crate lamp that I made. I keep collecting these things every time I see them. My dream is to make a fountain like they used to have at the restaurant at the Hanalei where they hold Tiki Oasis. Before they remodeled it, it was gorgeous. It was like lava rock walls. And then they had all of these uh, big clamshells pouring from one into another down like this wall. So I want to build one of those eventually. I think I have like seven or eight of these things this big. So eventually, that's the uh, that's the goal, either here or next house or wherever. A collection of uh, Polynesian hats will all be the bottoms of lamps eventually, or the tops of lamps actually, like that. This came out of Don the Beachcomber. I think it'd be really cool to do a lamp like this. I'd have to build build that middle piece so it, it sits okay, but. Um, I think that'd be cool. If I don't break it before I, I end up turning it into something. And then there's like a big life ring from a Long Beach tugboat. I looked it up, the Pacific something or other. Pacific King <laughs> was a tugboat out of Long Beach. Uh, I got that at the Newport Beach Balboa estate sale. This is like an incredible Papua New Guinea piece that just sits in my corner because I have, I'm out of room now. Totally out of room. This giant, Parasol came from my ex-roommate uh, Kevin Stewart, the bass player of Big Sandy. It's uh, like the biggest cocktail umbrella ever, <laughs> but it makes for great pinup backdrops. This is the ship's wheel that we use in our music video. You can see it again. It'll be linked in the description below and please check it out. It's pretty cool. It features the breezeway. And then over here in this mystery corner, there's another lamp that I built a few years back. This is a Papua New Guinea piece here. And then up there, this is a Marquesan shield. I don't know how authentic it is, but it kind of sits in my corner here. And then I have a couple fire bulbs and these lanterns here. That's from Oceanic Arts. There's another one. Ship's wheel that was like immaculate and then I burned it to give it that look. And then these panels down the sides here, I carved these. They're kind of hidden, but it's okay because they're not very good carvings. <laughs> but they're uh, tiki's. And then up here, another Marquesan guy like humping a pineapple tree. And then some Papua New Guinea stuff. This piece right here was actually left to me by my buddy Kevin. He said that that used to be in the Roxy stores for Quicksilver. You remember those? And then this is for Motionic Arts here. So this is another one of those chairs from Frankie's Tiki Room. You can see uh, there's the chair, the scuff marks from wallet chains or belts or whatever. But stoked to have it in the breezeway. Great carving work by my buddy Buzzy. And then uh, another Papua New Guinea guy with his thing out. And then this I found 
in that estate sale where that lady let me have that pile of stuff. From what I could figure out about it, this is a Tongan war club, like wrapped with rope, and it's heavy, man. I can't imagine if you got hit across the face with this thing, it would just tear your skin off. It is brutal. So, that hangs in here. And if anything ever goes down, uh, the first thing I'm running for is this thing. Another key to an effective tiki bar design, in my opinion, is the usage of a multitude of different materials. You can see in this area right here, there's woven lahala matting. There is this style of matting. There's bamboo. There's carved trim. By the way, I carved all of that trim all through the place. There's burned and stained wood, more bamboo. There's rope that border things. There's animal prints, even underneath the bar. I added rope lighting and tappa that you would never normally see. A couple little jars here. This is just a standard plantation rum one. This is vintage. Um, and then this is one that I actually tied myself out of, I think it's plantation rum too. But it took like a 12 year old Asian girl on YouTube to teach me how to do that. I want to see if you can see the skulls up in there. See? A couple skulls. Tasteful. Like not too much. And actually, there's this panel right here that I created. That was routered. And then these are all the lamps that I've made over the years, or at least a lot of them. Not this green one in the front, but most of the other ones. That's a vintage tiki hibachi, like tabletop tiki hibachi. For our music video shoot, I created a menu for the breezeway. See? There it is. with locations all over, including Costa Mesa, Beverly Hills, San Francisco, and Waikiki. These chairs are actually both from Don the Beachcomber. And my goal would be to have a bigger table in here with a ship's wheel as the table. So we'll get to that eventually. You know, I guess I could weigh in on what makes a good tiki bar. And if you're thinking about building your own tiki bar, I would say that the number one thing is layers. Layers and layers and layers of stuff. And no white walls, that's a, that's a bamboo pen mantra. No white walls and layers and layers of stuff. And to me, the vintage stuff gives you a more authentic feel rather than buying brand new stuff. Hawaiian tikis, stuff from vintage tiki bars like Trader Vic's. Hell, even your old broken mugs work great. It's from the Bali High and I think Massachusetts. Ugh, I hate it when this stuff gets broken. But I don't throw it away because it, it's still decor, you know? Items from the sea can be great in a tiki bar, but not too much, you know what I mean? It's those things that add to the ambiance and set the scene rather than be the scene, if you know what I mean. But things like these flickering bulbs give a sense of ambiance, it's very, um, Disney-esque. It's the kind of stuff that you would you would see them do in Pirates of the Caribbean. But the Caribbean, 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 that's the wrong sea. So pirates are not tiki. We're talking about Polynesia, the Pacific Islands, the Marquesas, Rapa Nui, Papua New Guinea, those kind of places. Anyway, the vintage aesthetic is dark. It's mysterious, it's dangerous. It's not, you hear people a lot say, tiki is whatever, whatever you want it to be. And it's like, no, tiki's not whatever you want it to be. Tiki's specific. Please go and buy Sven Kirsten's book, The Book of Tiki, and Tiki Pop, and Tiki Modern. They're all incredible books. But Sven was the one that really outlined 
the aesthetic rules for what tiki is and it's specific it really is and there are a lot of people that that will say that it's not specific and and tiki is whatever you want it to be and that's fine like that's that's totally fine if you want to do that in your own bar i'm not gonna but don't be surprised if people who are tiki purists don't exactly hold your space in the same regard that's all it's about exotic locales and it's about transporting yourself from wherever you are in the world to some Polynesian island full of mystery and adventure. There were a lot of great tiki bars in Hawaii, but it makes more sense for there to be a great tiki bar in Ohio. It's escapist. If you're in Hawaii, what do you need to escape to? You're already there. If you're in Ohio, it's snowing and you're in Ohio. So you could walk into a place like the Kahiki with like, I don't know how tall that thing was, a four-story Moai fireplace. Man, I wish I would have gone to that. So I guess I would say that the breezeway is basically if a sailor had run aground, built himself a shack, and then decorated it with the art of the Polynesian peoples of the area. I think that's kind of what it is. And I think that's kind of what Don Beach was doing too, when he created Don the Beachcomber. I think that was the intent. All right, let's go to the main bar. So this is the main bar of the Breezeway. The uh, stools are vintage Whitco. The bar is a vintage ship's hatch bar that Bamboo Ben actually pulled out of a home and uh, sold to me for a very reasonable amount. And then uh, the bar, the corners are from Oceanic Arts, carved by Leroy Schmaltz. And then the whole rest of the bar was either carved by me or carved and built by myself and my buddy Josh. And in fact, we even installed this little um, hatch here with this little uh, dick guy, we call him, because he's got a thing, but a uh, little Marquesan tiki that sits in there, kind of guards over everything. I remember when I bought that tiki, I remember Bob from Oceanic Arts saying, because they made two different kinds of them, and he, he was like, uh, you, you sure you want the one with the pecker or, uh, or no pecker? <laughs> I was like, Oh, for sure, we need the pecker on them. And Josh and I happened to find this old Submariner's plaque at the Long Beach Swap Meet. And, and my dad was actually on a submarine out of Hawaii, and I thought it was kind of a nice tribute to uh, put that thing in there. The concept was that the ship's hatch had these, the concept was that the ship hatch had these mother of pearl pieces that were that were resin down into it so we just repeated that idea here with the submariner's crest and underneath that is mother of pearl the back of the bar is an important place because that's where your patrons that's where your friends are going to be sitting there needs to be a lot of interest behind you because a good tiki bar you don't see everything the first time. Hell, you don't see everything the second or third time. I've been to the Maikai like six times, six times? Maybe like six times now. And there's no way I've seen everything. Every time I go in there, I see something new and it's, it's exciting. That's why I love going to the Maikai so much. But even just varying shelf heights, I'm sure if you're talking about outfitting a commercial bar, there's probably stuff that I don't understand that needs to be there, certain things. But that doesn't mean that you can't add in those decorative elements amongst the functional things to create something of interest. Uh, just to go through a couple things that I have in my back bar here, both of these masks are vintage Oceanic Arts. And when you open them up, there's Japanese newsprint in there, tying back to kind of the World War II aesthetic when GIs came back from World War II. That's kind of the birth of the Tiki Bar. This Moai turns out that was actually, was actually from Oceanic Arts. Turns out this was probably used to make the molds for maybe Aku Aku tiki mugs. You know those black tiki mugs? I don't know, it's made out of wood. There's some Hawaiian tourist tikis over here. These big guys, look at that. I got, I got this for 20 bucks. This is vintage Oceanic Arts. In fact, Tiki Diablo, Danny Gardo, uh, hit me up and asked for reference photos of this because he ended up sculpting that into a tiki mug. But his girlfriend 
lives right over here. And it's so irregular to see female tiki's because they call Tiki the first man. And I know that man is used interchangeable with men and women, but it's very rare that you see a female Tiki. So this one's, uh, looks like she's holding her, holding her boobies or something. This is one of my favorite things. This is the Maikai decanter from the Maikai in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. It's a Coco Joe's piece of a maiden praying to a Hawaiian god. The reason I have a, a fairly common three-faced bucket on my shelf here is because the Kona, Hawaii, where this is from, was right down the street in Santa Ana off of, uh, or on Harbor Boulevard. So I like to have some stuff that was regionally close in my tiki bar too. I never got to go there. There was a, there was a bridge that went over that you'd walk over and it was supposed to be really cool. A vintage skull mug. And then I've got some nudie cards from the 50s that are Polynesian theme. This girl's playing ukulele. This one's looking at a, a mask or something. But as a pinup photographer, I, I love seeing this stuff. I love seeing the original stuff. All three of these masks were found at that estate sale that was uh, the Newport Beach Balboa one, the nautical antique dealer guy. I got each one of these for $20? I'm telling you, it was, it was like a bloodbath in there for me. Like best estate sale of my life. Marquesan guy. Another Moai from Rapa Nui. This guy's got his hat on. And I have a few ashtrays too. It's from the Bali High in uh, Shelter Island, San Diego, which is still there. This is from the Stardust. And the Stardust itself wasn't tiki themed, but the Stardust was home to the Aku Aku. And my first couple cocktail videos, you'll see, we're gonna talk about the Aku Aku. And the inside, I resined in a, uh, a nudie playing card and some, some gold sparkle. This ashtray is from the Vacation Village in uh, Mission Bay, San Diego, which is where Tiki Oasis has just moved to. Wow, that just blew my mind. I didn't make the connection until now. That's cool. Hopefully it happens. Oh man, I hope it happens. If it does, we're performing on Wednesday night at the Bali High, the Hula Girls, our triumphant return. This is one of my favorite finds. Uh, I found this in, a, in somebody's garage at an estate sale. It's Trader Vic's pomegranate grenadine syrup. But the cool thing to me is that the, is that the illustration of the girl on the, on the front is topless. I think it's so funny how we think of the 50s and 60s as so puritanical. And then there you go a mainstream marketed product showing a topless girl. Now, if you did that today, it'd be like a firestorm. People would freak out. These are kind of some of my mid-tier Tiki mugs. The really valuable stuff I keep inside and the really, really valuable stuff I keep in my bedroom. But uh, there's some stuff up here that's just not necessarily as, as common or a little bit more valuable. There's a there's a Stockton Islander palm tree hula girl mug. And then some kind of common stuff. This is from the Honolulu in Westboro, Massachusetts. I don't really know where all these are from, but I do need to earthquake putty these down. This guy is, but... And then this is a decanter. I don't know if you can see that. Let me see if I can put a light on it. This right here is a decanter that I found in Morro Bay. I bought it for $2. Those are my favorite. $2. And then foliage, you know, that what we talked about earlier, about the jungle coming in and encroaching on the space. Not everything has to be pure tiki, not everything has to be pure Polynesian, but it all has to live in the same kind of exotica world. Shriner's Fez comes from the era, not exactly tiki, but somehow, somehow Shriner Fezes have ended up in tiki. I think it has an interesting exotic feel to it. Plus I was thinking about those shag paintings where it's always the Shriners getting drunk in tiki bars. <laughs> Got a shrunken head over here. Then I have some bottles of booze over here. Some of them are full, some of them aren't. And then I keep this behind the bar too. These are from a place called the Spider Pool. And if you don't know about the Spider Pool, I did a story about it on the Hula Girls YouTube account a little while ago. Check it out. It's about 1950s, 1960s pinup stuff. It's a cool story. Super cool. So, check it out. And then once you're done with that, go over to the Spike in the Camera YouTube page 
and there is a photo shoot that I did with Brianna Ashley and Eden Berlin and my buddy Taz up in the Hollywood Hills. And this has to do with the spider pool. So check it out. It sits behind my bar here. That's how much I like to reference it. The other thing, ship's lights add to the nautical flair of traveling to a South Pacific island on a boat and maybe getting shipwrecked and then maybe just making the best of it. You know what I mean? That's what this is. This is like a shipwreck fantasy. So the main reason for making this video, I want to let you know that I'm going to start creating videos from this spot right here. We're going to go through the Total Tiki app. We're going to make all of the cocktails. All of them. I'm not a professional bartender. I've been making drinks for a long, long time, probably 15, 17 years, 15, 17 years, something like that. But my goal is to go through the cocktails, taste them, give you my honest opinion of them. Maybe I'll give some pointers along the way about kind of the right way to go about making these cocktails, but we're gonna be doing it together. So I'll be learning too. And, and I'm excited to taste some weird stuff because I know a lot of those cocktails are not things that I ever wanted to make. You look at them and you go, ooh, there's like chartreuse in there. Chartreuse, is that a thing? So anyway, I just wanted to give you a quick tour. I don't know how quick that was. I wanted to give you a tour of the breezeway to let you know the environment that the cocktails are being made in and a bit of knowledge about where I come from as far as not being somebody just jumping on say a, a trend about cocktails. I hope it lended some insight into where I come from as far as somebody who is wildly passionate about tiki and that's all encompassing with the art, the music, and the cocktails. So I hope you will join me as we go through a lot of different recipes together. And, uh, and they start right now. Aloha. Mm -hmm.